name's Josh Collier. I am uh, the FinOps lead for Grammarly. So I just lead the, anything that has to do with cloud cost management for Grammarly, I lead. And uh, I come from Northern Virginia. I mean, it's going to be in every kind of nook and cranny of FinOps um, from, you know, understanding how to manage it, which is we're already seeing at the conference this year, um, to actually what I'm in more excited about right now is how to use AI to help you with FinOps. And I think that's going to continue to mature. But uh, more specifically, uh, it's going to, you know, introduce new challenges around just understanding how to forecast based on tokens and other terminology and, and, and things that didn't really exist before. But on top of that, it's also just a variety of um, GNAI um, offerings that are across vendors that are very different, very volatile. Um, so those areas are going to have to probably, you know, have new approaches than what we've had with traditional cloud FinOps in the past. Um, but I think a lot of the same concepts we, we can be carried over from traditional FinOps too. The prices we're applying to uh, FinOps costs, um, I mean, first is only, only try to, uh, you know, use what you need. Uh, so for example, um, at Grammarly, we use a lot of Gen AI provision capacity. So where you're actually having to, to purchase at the peak um, of what your usage is actually supposed to be. Uh, so in that sense, you're going to have waste. So it's all about minimizing it and making sure that, you know, you, you first have enough for your application, but you're not just overbuying just to be super safe. So there's a balance that has to be struck there. So, um, so really, in, in that sense, it's, it's workload management along with um, also just rate optimization, using provision capacity where it makes sense, using you know, shared capacity where it makes sense for our own hosted models. You know, what makes sense to be hosted, what makes sense to maybe import in to a, to a third party, um, you know, what makes sense, you know, in an open source or, or completely closed source models. Um, so it's all about, at the end of the day, what is delivering the most value. We don't need the reasoning model for a lot of the chat completions. We could use, uh, you know, the nanos and micros of the world type models that are going to be speedy and, and give a, deliver a great, um, you know, experience to our customers. And it's all about balancing those things. Uh, some of the challenges around optimizing AI is, is first, it's just it's sensitivity to, to prompts, um, to, to just changing a, a comma or just a very small thing, seemingly small thing to a prompt or, you know, adding the context that's being added to it um, can have a big impact on the cost and output and quality and all those things. So um, that sensitivity in itself can, um, you know, create a lot of risks in, in using it. Or if somebody decides to run, you know, do a run that needs to be in batch processing, they use a standard endpoint, it can cost a ton of money. So there, there's a lot more sensitivity there than I would say versus a traditional um, FinOps. And then when you have just, you know, AI workloads that are hosted, uh, now you have all these choices. Should I host this model? Should I, you know, put it in one of the, the uh, you know, bedrocks or the other vendors and, and have them manage that model for me. So now you're looking at these options and having to, to try to compare traditional kind of compute costs to these brand new Gen AI managed services, which can be a challenge in itself. And then deciding on how, to, how you optimize those two things are very, very different. So how I report uh, or track the efficiency of, of AI is first looking at I mean, obvious one's cost per token, um, but I would say you know, before that, understanding what the use case is for this model and saying, okay, is this extra reasoning aspect to it worth the additional cost versus something that's you know speedier and and you know maybe gives a bit you know not quite as full um, outputs, but still like what our users are looking for. So that finding um, finding that balance and uh, now, once you have that, understand that efficiency, and then it's going to be very clear in, in the model, now you're able to tie back, okay, this is doing the, the reasoning and, and bringing the value of this product that we couldn't have before, bringing in more subscriptions and customers and, it's, and such. That's bringing revenue in, obviously, and then that's going to show the ROI for that model. So, um, so how we really measure efficiency is how is it increasing our, our engagement um, you know, in these services or from our users? Um, if it's increasing our engagement and it's on the lower cost end, then great. That's like the efficiency that we're looking for. Um, but outside of that, I mean, it's, it's coming back to your normal metrics, you know, cost per token, the amount of um, maybe throughput you're getting per unit, um, 
the, the overhead required in, in managing that. So these are things that don't necessarily seem as directly connected to FinOps, but you know, when you look at how complicated it is to manage some of this capacity, that is an aspect that you, know, you can move faster and you can do a lot more, much more quickly, if the, uh, the, the management and there's flexibility in, in the commitments you're able to make with the capacity are there. If the flexibility is not there, now it's gonna limit what you're gonna be able to do and in turn, reduce the efficiency. I would say I'm surprised by, so who's looking at it? I mean, from our, our CTO and, and VPs, um, our finance people, or, you know, they ask, do ask a decent amount of questions. I have a close relationship with our FP&A team, and they, they ask really good questions. Um, but I'm probably most surprised by the engineering teams. Um, they have a lot of questions around, um, you know, why a certain thing is costing the, the amount it is, or if they're trying to price out something new, I've got to kind of talk with them through about, the, the, the aspects of fixed capacity and say, you know, yeah, this is like the on-demand <laughs> cost for if you were to run this on standard endpoint, but when you're using fixed capacity, maybe, maybe you know, you could use our, our current capacity. We don't have to buy anything more. So the additional cost is quite low, but maybe you're enough, it's enough throughput. But we do have to actually increase capacity. So that's like a good chunk of money we, that's dedicated to you. So that's a bit, bit more nuanced. Um, so talking that through with the engineering teams, I've found like, once they understand the dynamics of it, they're pretty good about coming back and saying, oh, we need X number of units, or um, you know, the better they understand it, then the better they can build and, and plan. Uh, so I would say the engineers and the product builders have surprised me the most around you know, just asking the really, some really good questions. Something I wish I, I learned a, a bit sooner when I was managing Gen AI costs was uh, the fact that once you benchmark an endpoint or a model, you need to continuously do it. Um, so we, we experienced over 50% um, increase in throughput per unit on our gender capacity for the same model over you know, less than a 12 month period. And we didn't realize it until much later. So we were wasting money up to that point and didn't know it. And that's because these vendors are optimizing on the back end um, these, uh, their this provision capacity and you're not gonna know it unless you're load testing. Um, so, uh, you know, metrics have gotten more advanced now. You can see utilization, it should show up there, but just understanding um, that, you know, benchmarking these things, first off, holds the, uh, the vendor accountable if there is any kind of deficiencies, which um, we have seen early on, not as much recently, but also understanding, hey, you know, we have more throughput. We don't have to be as aggressive with our capacity commitments as we were before. Uh, when I spoke last year, I was under the assumption that a lot of people were doing the things I'm doing. Um, so when I was prepping for this, or as I got more involved in the foundation, I realized, oh, a lot of people aren't doing millions of tokens per minute on these <laughs> services. Um, so you know, I, I didn't realize I had something special to share. And I think once you, the more you get involved with the community, um, the more reali you realize how unique your experience is and you have the opportunity to really share something that other people haven't experienced. So I've really kind of learned that, you know, Grammarly is on the cutting edge of, of a lot of what's happening in AI right now and I'm in a unique position to be able to kind of share those experiences, um, you know, with, with the community. And it's been, it's been great. I've learned a lot of, of where a lot of people are um, in their kind of FinOps and AI journey. Um, and it's also kind of, I've, I've heard some, met with some people that are much deeper in AI than I could ever wish to be, and I've learned a lot from them. So it is a, definitely a win-win once you start sharing and getting involved. Um, so my advice to somebody that's kind of on the cusp, and, and, and maybe they're a bit unsure if they could have value to add. I mean, you don't know until you try. And I, again, I, if, you, if you start uh, just being involved with the community and just actually looking for opportunities to share or looking for areas you're like, well, actually, I have a lot of experience in this area. You're going to be surprised in how many areas of opp and opportunities you're going to find, for sure. Uh, so uh, like most things, getting involved with AI, getting involved with the foundation, just look for opportunities to do it, and you're going to find your place uh, more than likely. And, um, or, and if, you, if you don't find something unique at the moment, then you're gonna go and, and learn more about it, and chances are you're gonna find that opportunity to really uh, make a difference. I expect a lot of acceleration of use in these managed, managed um, AI services. Um, so instead of hosting the model in your infra, you're gonna be hosting it on a, on a vendor's infrastructure, so it, you don't have to worry about the operational overhead and, and growing the overhead of actually managing the model, you're just hitting an API endpoint. Um, we've seen token 
costs, cost per token come down over 80% over the last 12 months. Um, the, the competition between the vendors is going to continue to drive those costs down. So I would say for a lot of, you know, for most companies, it may not be as cost efficient right now to use those. But at the same time, it's, it's kind of the easy button. You start hitting those endpoints. You don't have to like have somebody train a model. You don't have to have somebody kind of understand the best way to host it and auto scaling and all those aspects. Um, you just start hitting this endpoint. Um, so I think because it is such a low barrier to entry, as we see costs come down and these services mature, because we're still quite in early days for a lot of these services, it's going to make more sense for more individuals to start uh, using these managed services. Um, and to be frank, uh, it, it's more portable to use these services. And more portability leads to ability to kind of create vendor competition between the vendors. And, and so there's this, it's just a total win for, for uh, cloud customers and FinOps practitioners when you have the ability to, to just move from one endpoint to another, depending on which one's make, giving you the best offering. Hey everyone, producer Andrew here. Thank you so much for watching and for your support. For more FinOps content, go check out our YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, and leave comments and questions for all of our wonderful speakers. We appreciate your support.